Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized tonight's event. I'd like to welcome our online audiences, and uh, you're being brought into another virtual discussion with an author here at the Commonwealth Club. We've done over 300 of them uh, since the crisis began, uh, and our facilities were shut down for live performances. And I'd also like to welcome the audiences that watch it later on our YouTube and Facebook channels. So uh, today's uh, author is Jonathan Alter who uh, has finished the first major biography of uh, President Jimmy Carter. It's called His Very Best. Um, and it's about um, the entire life that Jimmy Carter lived, uh, both pre and post presidency, but also very much about all the policies he put in place uh, during the 1977 to 81 uh, presidential four years that he had in office. Um, since a lot of people don't pay close attention to what Carter did, this should be very enlightening uh, as to what went right and what went wrong uh, during those years. So thank you very much for joining us, uh, Jonathan. Great um, to be and, here, George. And thanks for putting in the time, uh, you know, to produce this kind of a biography. Uh, I know it took more than a year or two, if not five. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> quite a bit more than a year or two. Um, biographies <laughs> are big projects. And I, I think people know that Robert Caro has spent more than, than 40 years on his multi-volume uh, biography of Lyndon Johnson. And I'm not on that plan, but it did take me about five and a half years to complete this. And there were, you know, uh, thousands of documents that I reviewed, uh, not just at the Carter Library in Atlanta, but at other libraries. And I interviewed about 260 people, including uh, President and Mrs. Carter and uh, 10 other members of their family and all of the people around President Carter who are still alive. And I, you know, I had to kind of do it in reverse actuarial order because um, uh, some of them are quite old. Uh, mm -hmm. And if I think about people like uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski, who was his national security advisor, or uh, uh, Harold Brown, uh, who had been the president of the California Institute of Technology and became his defense secretary, they both died shortly after I interviewed them. Mm -hmm. so I felt like I had a, a ticking clock uh, on this particular project, and it still took me <laughs> quite a bit of time. Yeah, well, uh, you mentioned that you mentioned you talked to several people in the family and they, quite a colorful family it was. So uh, why don't we start with his uh, child, as you do in the book, with his childhood and his family, the members, uh, his mother, Lillian, a few a few stories that kind of give away uh, what he grew up with because it's a very he went a long way from where he grew up to where he ended up yeah yeah this uh is an epic american life and um i i came to think that he actually is the only president or major figure who effectively lived in three centuries he was born in 1924 in Plains, Georgia, but it might as well have been the 19th century. Mm -hmm. because, uh, his farm had no running water, no electricity, no mechanized farm equipment. He was barefoot for most of the year. Uh, sharecropper system of that time, it was just, uh, it was feudalism. It was one step up uh, from uh, slavery. And, mm -hmm. and in fact, uh, there were older people in his community who, uh, uh, had been children and 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 actually enslaved as children who were still alive uh, at the time of his birth. And then, of course, vital part of the 20th century and now in his post-presidency on the cutting edge of all the big issues of the 21st century, global health, democracy promotion, uh, uh, conflict resolution. These are the things that the Carter Center, which he founded, it, uh, they're involved in. Um, but his life on the farm... Um, was really rather extraordinary. His his father uh, was a white supremacist. His mother, Ms. Lillian, who was so amusing that Johnny Carson had her on TV a lot when Carter was mm -hmm. president. Um, 
She uh, was a nurse and she took care of black patients for free and was basically the only person in Sumter County, Southwest Georgia, who had anything nice to say about Abraham Lincoln. Uh, And then there was a third parent because his mother was off nursing so much of the time. In fact, she delivered Rosalind Carter, who Jimmy Mm -hmm. Carter met his future wife when he was not yet three years old because his mother had delivered her. Uh, And um, she uh, was so busy that in many ways he considered himself to have been raised by a woman named Rachel Clark, who was a uh, a black farmhand who signed her name with an X, but um, taught him to revere nature and God. And, you know, these two parts of him, the, the environmentalist conservationist and, and the uh, man of faith, you know, are very important parts of who Jimmy Carter became. So, um, but, you know, he's, he's living in a, a really, really mean county, and yet he's personally um, tolerant from a very young age. Uh, but then when he comes back uh, from the Navy, he go, goes off to the Naval Academy and um, is in Admiral Rickover's Navy, which in the middle part of the 20th century was the most exciting technological project in the world. They were attaching a nuclear power plant to a submarine before they were even built on land, right? Mm -hmm. Well, this was an extraordinary technological achievement that Admiral Rickover was responsible for. And people like Colin Powell say that nuclear submarines and later aircraft carriers won the Cold War because they changed the strategic balance with the Soviet Union. So this was a hugely exciting project he was involved in. Then in 1953, his father dies and he goes back to Plains, Georgia, take over his father's uh, peanut warehouse and farm and a lot of his other civic responsibilities. And the following year, you have Brown versus Board of Education. And suddenly the South is in this kind of period of what can only be described as white terrorism, uh, which he was kind of caught up in and and ducked, basically. He ducked the civil rights movement in order to stay in business and have any political viability. So um, then, you know, eventually he becomes governor in 1971. And I argue that he kind of makes, uh, spends the second half of his life making up for what he didn't do in the first half, namely mm-hmm. stand up uh, for racial justice. And um, in that sense, there's a lesson for us that it's it's never too late to stand up. But that that first half of his life, uh, I found absolutely fascinating uh, to research as he as he uh, he tried to to navigate a, a really uh, an evil system that he was uh, living in. It seems fascinating that that uh, two of the presidents that had the biggest impact were both uh, Southerners, of Texas. Lyndon Johnson and then Carter, um, having grown up in it, and neither of them um, s- striking people as being natural uh, at at this process, but something that they had going in, something that was driving them inside. But not they weren't naturally; they were born naturally. I mean, they were raised in another way. So uh, fascinating that they had such an impact, and and uh, not too surprisingly, if you, if, if they take that on, somebody else has to take it on, right? Yeah. Very, very different figures. And, uh, I found a little bit, uh, um, Carter wrote Johnson, uh, a letter at one point after he became governor, he never, um, actually, uh, met with him. Um, Mm -hmm. and in the famous playboy interview, which was right before the 1976 election when Carter was first, you know, elected president, and it cost him a lot. I think people remember, you know, he said, I have yeah. lost in my heart. We can talk about all of that. But um, it, the uh, the uh, Playboy um, reporters who did the interview, you know, told me they thought the news out of it was going to be that um, Carter attacked not just Nixon, but also LBJ as liars. So mm-hmm. he said LBJ, you know, lied about the Vietnam War. He was very admiring of what he did domestically and on civil rights, mm-hmm. but uh, although not at the time, 
because right. he was, you know, in 1964, when the Civil Rights Act was passed, 1965, when the Voting Rights Act was passed, Jimmy Carter was not out there saying he supported it yeah. because uh, he was a, a Georgia state senator at the time representing a very conservative district. He couldn't do it. But later, he greatly appreciated what Johnson did domestically, not in Vietnam. And uh, he, but mostly it was on this question of integrity. And, and Carter mm. ran for president promising not to to lie. One of his advisors said, you're going to lose the liar vote. You know, <laughs> every man who cheats on his wife, you're going to lose all the, but he didn't, you know, after Watergate, people were ready uh, for, um, for a sense of decency, healing, integrity. Mm-hmm. It, a lot of the same themes that Joe Biden struck this, this past year. Well, even liars don't want the, the president to lie to them. Uh, so uh, it's a little like right. he, he did and, get probably and, some of the liar vote. <laughs> like, can you imagine? I mean, I think that Donald Trump, you know, according to, you know, pretty neutral estimates, it's up over 40,000 lies that he told when he was president. And they've documented every single one. Jimmy mm-hmm. Carter, he exaggerated. He told stories that were, you know, stretched a little bit like fish stories, you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he did that maybe even a little more than some other politicians, but I never, I looked really hard. I didn't come up with any, what are now called like, you know, four or five Pinocchio uh, lies. Pinocchio (laughs) in the Washington Post does it by how how long he knows. He (laughs) he just didn't tell whoppers. And he actually often had this TMI problem where he was too honest Mm -hmm. and he, he revealed too much. And so I mean, one of my favorite stories on this was that at one point he got a severe case of hemorrhoids and mm-hmm. and uh, he had to miss work. And, um, you know, the press officer said, well, we'll, you know, we'll tell some, some cover story about why he can't come to work. Mm-hmm. And he said, no, you know, markets, foreign governments, they, they can't have, that doesn't work. You can't say we don't know what's wrong with the president. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got to say what I have. Mm-hmm. And so they did. And of course he came in for a lot of ribbing for that as he did for mm-hmm. a number of other things, but there, there are many other similar examples when he was just transparent to a fault. And of course, much of the legislation on ethics that he put through and he got a lot of bills through, this is something people who think he was a failure don't understand. Uh, you know, among them were the Ethics and Government Act and the Inspector General's Act, uh, which protected whistleblowers and and created uh, the IGs and, and FISA courts. All the things that led to the first impeachment of Donald Trump wouldn't have been possible without uh, Jimmy Carter. And, and as I, you know, try to show, that's just uh, the beginning of uh, his achievements uh, legislatively. He was a, a political failure. He got swamped by Ronald Reagan, made a lot of political mistakes, but a substantive and often farsighted success. Well, before we go on to the uh, governorship and the presidency in more detail, um, a couple of things uh, from uh, the youth. Uh, one thing, you, you mentioned the story where his mother uh, was the nurse helping the birth of Rosalind uh, when he was under three years old. So he met her over 90 years ago. They're both yes. still alive. Uh, yeah. They're in their mid 90s. It's really quite a long. I mean, they didn't partner up until she was 18. But even so, that's really a long relationship. Um, and you cover their relationship as a partnership. You said that she she became a different kind of first lady because he relied on her. You, you especially you quoted one note which says, "I checked with," and the first person he mentions is Rosalind. And then yeah, he, yeah. So why don't yeah, you say a little I, I, bit about that partnership? Well, it was extraordinary. Um, you know, uh, when you write one of these things, you're always hoping for some breaks. And the biggest break that I got was after, you know, I had, after I had done several interviews with them, uh, they trusted me enough. And this is not an authorized biography. I didn't, uh, mm-hmm. it, it, I did it with their, their um, cooperation, but they didn't have any say over what I did. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh Rosalind Carter gave me the love letters that Jimmy wrote from the Navy. uh, And they are 
steamy, to put it mildly. They they uh, make mm-hmm. uh, John and Abigail Adams look very tame by comparison. They're, they're quite. Uh, uh, there's there's nothing that we've ever seen like it from a future president and first lady. Um, and that was just uh, the big, you know, they were not yet the partners that they later became because Jimmy was still in some ways treating her uh, in more traditional fashion. Like when he quit the Navy, he made the decision without her. When he first ran for office for state Senate, he made the decision without her. And he now really regrets that. Um, and, mm-hmm. and he learned a lot and they established a, an extraordinarily close uh, partnership and basically revolutionized the role of first lady uh, uh, in that uh, she um, not just sat in on cabinet meetings, which I think people know, but she shepherded legislation. The first mental health legislation was her bill. She was a diplomat for him. She was much more influential than Eleanor Roosevelt. And I would argue than Hillary Clinton because her relationship with her husband was closer. Uh, and they, um, and she's an enormously formidable woman uh, mm-hmm. who it continues to do really important work. And unlike her husband, she really doesn't have any critics. Usually the staff has a problem with the spouse mm-hmm. and because they think they kind of get in the way or whatever. In this case, they all uh, revered Rosalind and they would use her to get messages to Jimmy because everybody, including Jimmy, agrees that she has a better political head than he does. She is mm-hmm. savvier than he is. And uh, at one point I asked her whether he was stubborn and she just laughed because everybody kind of <laughs> knows that Jimmy Carter is a very stubborn individual. If he had, and she said, of course he is. If, she had, uh, if he had listened to her a little more, he would have been better off politically because her antenna were much, much better than his. Well, you mentioned that she uh, was uh, diplomatically successful in South America uh, yeah. and that she traveled around. I would say a little bit about that because that's, that's pretty fascinating, right? That, that she really did this without him, uh, not without him, but. Yeah. And I mean, there were, well, I mean, he, uh, um, you know, sent her on this mission, but uh, mm-hmm. she was very, it was a very successful mission and they uh, helped build support uh, for. Um, uh, his human rights policy, um, which was one of his most visionary policies, and for the Panama Canal mm-hmm. treaties, um, which were very influential in improving relations throughout Central and Latin America, and and prevented a war in Central America, which we can we can talk about. But there are many other things. I mean, one of them that I think is especially uh, relevant right now is that. Rosalind Carter um, decided that it wasn't good to have children come to school who had not been vaccinated. And this was not something that could be um, legislated from Washington, but she did get some additional money in the Department of Health and Human Services. And then she and Betty Bumpers, who was the wife of uh, Dale Bumpers, senator from Arkansas, they traveled all around the country to state legislatures and they convinced like, I think it was two thirds of the states to enact legislation that required vaccinations before children could enter school. Now we just take that for granted now. Mm -hmm. That was one of her minor accomplishments as first Mm -hmm. lady. So again, I think what happened is because things went south for the Carter presidency, and he left in such bad odor. Many of these, uh, many of these achievements, uh, and we we've just scratched the surface of them so far. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, were overlooked. Um, but in the in the interim, you know, they did have their ups and downs in their in their marriage. And just I mentioned that uh, she wasn't happy that he decided to quit the navy because she was really glad to be uh, out of planes. And when he mm-hmm. decided to go home. Uh, And they were uh, stationed in Schenectady in Schenectady in New York, where he was Mm -hmm. working on uh, the second prototype of a nuclear submarine. Um, She gave him the silent treatment most of the way on the drive, Mm -hmm. uh, all the way down to Plains, Georgia. And she'd say to their six-year-old son, Jack, you know, tell your father we need to stop. (laughs) So I, I, I don't, 
you know, this is a life that I'm writing about. And I, 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 I get into the, you know, sometimes um, uh, very um, sad or, you know, tense mm-hmm. dynamics that exist in many American families. And there are people in their family who've had real trouble with substance abuse. And, you know, I deal with with all of that. And I interviewed mm-hmm. uh, all four of their children. A lot of people think that Amy was their only child because she yeah. was living in the white house at the time. Uh, she actually has three older brothers, the youngest of whom is uh, 14 years older than she is. So they had three sons. And then uh, years later, Amy uh, and um, all of them got involved in, uh, in his campaigns. And he, often said that he wouldn't have been elected without the uh, support of his, his uh, family and his neighbors in Plains who had this thing called a peanut brigade where they would go north and knock on doors and convince people that this obscure former uh, governor of Georgia was worth their attention. Well, before we uh, totally leave the, those early things, you had several very uh, charming stories. Uh, one of them um, that gives a little insight into how tough his father was on him was that the father made too many shoes uh, yeah. for, for ladies. Yeah. yeah. So why don't you tell that? That just, that just was yeah. very tough. <laughs> so, so when, when after Jimmy Carter left the presidency, he, he is kind of a Renaissance man. And, and even when he doesn't have a skill, he tries to engineer that skill. So he, he wanted, he'd always wanted to write poetry. And he, when he finally had the time he did, and he, he got some poets to advise him and his poetry really improved. And he published a book of poems called Always a Reckoning. And there's one poem in there about how his father insisted that everything come out even and that uh, nothing go to waste. And his father was talking about not a racial reckoning, uh, which we're going through now, which Carter later believed in, but a uh, a, a, a reckoning on you know what he had invested. So he, in addition to farming, uh, he was a cobbler and he he had all kinds of trades that he pursued. And he would he made milkshakes, you know, he made ketchup to sell in the stores in America's Plains, the county seat. And uh, one year he made a lot of women's shoes, and they were those kind of high button shoes that uh, they wore at the turn of the 20th century, um, you know, that you'd see in Mary Poppins or something like that. Mm -hmm. And they, for whatever reason, they didn't sell. So he had all of these spare shoes and he insisted that his son wear them to school so they didn't go to waste. And of course, you know, he was ridiculed in school for for doing that. And he was already very short for his age and called Mm -hmm. Pee-wee at school. Um, and, uh, but, you know, was able, uh, eventually to, um, emerge, uh, and, but he, he never was, um, one of those guys who, you know, dominates in school the way some mm-hmm. future presidents do. And uh, nobody, uh, in almost nobody in his, he was the only one from his high school class to go to college and nobody at the Naval Academy thought that he was going to be anything big. Mm -hmm. They thought that Stansfield Turner was in his class and became an admiral and eventually Carter's director of the CIA. He was the big man on campus. And Carter was a much more unprepossessing sort as a young person. One other story you tell that I thought was very useful was uh, that uh, he, uh, an undertaker, uh, there there was a debt or something, and uh, Jimmy uh, bought some shacks, like five shacks, and then rented them out. That was like one of his first entrepreneurial things. So he was a slum uh, landlord at 15 or something. Yeah, he was. I mean, his father, you know, wanted him to learn how to be in business. Mm-hmm. And yeah, he did have that period where he he um, uh, sold uh, some uh, cotton uh, and took the proceeds and bought these shacks. And then uh, when he was away at the Naval Academy, his father thought he hadn't been attending to them, which he hadn't. And so they were eventually sold, but uh, they were not uh, good living conditions, to put it mildly. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, 
he's not a saint. And a lot of people, they, they like to simplify and mm-hmm. assume that because uh, they admire him and he's very much worthy of our admiration, that he has led this you know, flawless uh, life. It's, it's been a, a compelling life and a life mm-hmm. of change. Uh, and, and he's always in a state of becoming something mm-hmm. new and he's never satisfied with what he's contributed. And that's why, you know, he, he never goes on Miller time, even when he's engaged in recreation. And when he had that one of his falls in recent years, he was in his 90s, his mid 90s, and he was going out hunting because he hadn't had his turkey quota yet. And he mm-hmm. fell in, you know, in the darkness or in the early morning. Uh, and of course, he, you know, until very recently, he would travel to all over the world monitoring elections, trying to make, uh, bring peace. Uh, and this um, kind of uh, passion to do more, to, to, to use what he was given, his stature as a former president to better not only himself, but other people, this, this drove him. And, and I think he is in many ways a driven individual. I asked his son, Jeff, what's the one word you would use to describe your father? And he said, intense. And so that kind of Zen quality, the cardigan sweater, the big smile that you see that's only one layer of Jimmy Carter. And I wanted to get down to these other layers uh, because he's not only an enormously intelligent person, one of the most intelligent by all accounts, most, one of the most intelligent people who's ever been president of the United States, but he's enormously complicated. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, You don't really, I mean, I, I do not claim to have written, the definitive biography of him, because I don't think you can be definitive about Jimmy Carter. The, the levels of complexity are, are too deep. Well, you, you call the book his very best, and then you explain the story where he gets this idea that he has to do his very best all the time. Um, and, and of course, uh, you, you say that he partially is making up for mistakes he made, when he ran for governor because he had lost to Lester Maddox, uh, a well-known uh, white supremacist, that he actually ran a relatively uh, racist campaign to win the Georgia uh, governorship. Why don't you tell that story? Because he, he not only played that card, but then he reversed the card upon his inauguration as governor. So Yeah, this was an extraordinary story. So he had lost for governor in 1966, and then he'd sunk into a depression and in, in 1967, which was relieved partly by the birth of Amy. And then in 1968, instead of being involved in all the big, you know, stories of that year, he goes on two uh, Baptist missions in the North. He goes door to door for Jesus as he's undergoing a born again experience. And at one point they come upon a brothel and he tries to talk uh, the madam into uh, embracing Christ. That doesn't quite work out, but um, <laughs> The whole time he's plotting his next campaign, and he really thinks that his purpose in life is to uh, try to achieve uh, elective office, higher office, uh, governor, so that he can improve the lives of people in Georgia. And he doesn't run a racist campaign. He never actually says anything racist, Mm -hmm. but he runs a dog whistle campaign where he says coded things, a code word campaign that appeal to racists and segregationists. His opponent was a former governor who uh, was very popular in Atlanta with moderates. And his opponent got 90% of the black vote, which was new because it had only been a few years since they had been allowed to vote in Georgia. Mm. Uh, So Carter to win, he had to win all the people in the rural counties, you know, the people who this last time voted for Trump or who voted for, you know, Purdue and Loeffler. And to win, he had to get that vote. So he did things like said nice things about George Wallace, like, oh, I'll welcome him to come in. And he paid a a visit on the founder of the White Citizens Council of Georgia, which really sent a message to those people. But at the same time, he was secretly meeting with Daddy King. He never knew Martin Luther King uh, mm-hmm. when he was 
Uh, you know, he never knew, never met King, never took the trouble because that would have been super unpopular in his district where his assassination was literally celebrated mm-hmm. in a bar outside Plains. Uh, but then by 1970, he's meeting secretly with Daddy King. And on the last day of the campaign, uh, his uh, pilot, who is this uh, very eccentric Jewish guy named David Rabhan, who had been one of the Atlanta Jews who had helped to underwrite the civil rights campaign, was very close to the King family and had introduced him to Daddy King. And he had flown Carter all over the state for free, which is was necessary for him to get elected. And so Carter says to him, you've done so much for me, David, can I do anything for you? And he said, yes, in your inaugural address, you can say the time for racial discrimination is over. And he, he pulls out a pencil. He writes it on the back of an aerial map. He tells Carter, sign it. Carter signs it. And then he says it in his inaugural address. Mm-hmm. And the white people there thought he had betrayed them. And mm-hmm. they called him an end loving bastard. And, and the black Georgians in attendance at the inauguration were they just were uh, amazed. He said, he said, what? They couldn't believe it. This sounds like nothing now, right? Mm -hmm. But in 1971 in Georgia, this was a huge deal. And then he made good on it. And, uh, and he became very close to the King family. He hung Dr. King's portrait in the Georgia state Capitol as the KKK protested outside. He integrated Georgia state government. He appointed black judges senior staff, African-American senior staff, and started to become the Jimmy Carter that we know today, spoke out against racial injustice. Um, But all of that happened only after he became governor, uh, because he felt, you know, I I asked him, I was pushing him hard on this 1970 campaign. And, you know, first he said, well, you know, I never claimed to be part of the civil rights movement. And then he finally said, um, you know, I basically, I had a choice. I could be governor or I could denounce segregation. I chose to be governor. Mm-hmm. Then he said, are we done talking about this yet? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I said, not quite. I still have another couple of questions about it. But he was very uh, open and answered, you know, over, over the course of many interviews, answered every question as honestly as he could. We had one very interesting story about Senator Leroy Johnson, who oh, was yeah. the first black senator. And and how he wanted a certain committee and how Jimmy didn't get it to him. And then he showed how politically astute he was by getting it a different way. But I still that story because I think that that's yeah. a, a great yeah, one. This, this is a, a fascinating guy who, who died not long after I interviewed him, who was the first Ge- African-American Georgia state senator since Reconstruction. And he was elected in 1962, the same year as Carter. He got there. Almost everybody ignored him. Uh, until they needed his vote. And Carter was more decent to him than others in the same way Carter was very decent to the first black midshipman at the Naval Academy. Mm -hmm. Um, But after he became governor, Senator Johnson wanted real power and he had a chance to become chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee in the Georgia State Senate. And to do so, he cut a deal with the Lieutenant Governor Lester Maddox Mm -hmm. segregationist. And Carter couldn't believe that he would do this. He said, you know, I'm the good guy. Maddox is the bad guy. Right. And Senator Johnson was, look, you know, uh, uh, he offered me judiciary. You offered me chairman of the temperance committee. What do you think (laughs) I was going to do? You know, (laughs) I mean, I don't know that much about, I drank, but that's all I know about temperance, you know, and, and, so it was an example of how Carter could be sometimes a little naive about how power really worked. And that was mm-hmm. true in Washington as well. But I think the misunderstanding, and he is, I think, one of the most misunderstood presidents in American history. People think that because he was a little naive politically, uh, that therefore he didn't get anything done. And he actually got more bills through mm-hmm. than either uh, Bill Clinton or Barack Obama, not to mention the Republicans who, you know, I mean, Trump only has two, only had two bills of any consequence that passed Congress in four years. Carter had dozens, uh, including 15 major pieces of environmental legislation. So his 
his naivete uh, and his kind of uh, sometimes not great relationship with Tip O'Neill, it, it didn't, it, it cost him on some things. So it, the fact that he and Ted Kennedy had this famous feud really hurt on health care. They couldn't get mm-hmm. a health care bill through and he failed on tax reform and welfare reform. But in many other areas, uh, he succeeded in part because he had a Democratic Congress for four years and and Clinton and Obama only had one for two. So uh, before we leave, you told a story a little earlier before he ran for governor, he, he, he did spent a, a year or two um, preaching or, or going around visiting people yeah. for the Baptist. Um, one of the things he did that you mentioned, which which surprised me, um, was that when he was speaking with foreign leaders after he did the work or before he did in the conversations, he would try to get them interested in Christ in addition to whatever else he was talking about. Uh, maybe we'd talk to the Chinese leaders like this and so on. Um, and I was wondering, uh, you know, if, say, Mitt Romney had become president and he had done the same thing as president going around and, and trying to, you know, having based on his, you know, two years, I'm sure, of service uh, that all the Mormons do. This is something that's a little bit unusual to, to, yeah. to hear yeah. from presidents is in the middle of their negotiation with these guys that they also uh, push their religion a little bit. And he wasn't and he was a, a, a separation of church and state kind of guy. Yeah, in way- yeah. Um, in the United States. So it was very interesting to hear that he didn't do that when he was abroad as if, you know. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's really fascinating because I, I hadn't really known how strongly he felt about the separation of church and state. So he, he didn't uh, allow like prayer breakfasts or anything like that in his white mm-hmm. house. He, you know, you would think that he would be close to Billy Graham because theologically they were very close and, mm-hmm. Uh, Graham <laughs> ticked him off for reasons that I explained that relate to the right. uh, uh, to the uh, Playboy interview. But mostly it was that he just didn't think it was right to do that. And he actually, as a even as a Georgia state senator, he he introduced a constitutional amendment in Georgia to reinforce the separation of church and state in Georgia. Um, but when he was having a personal conversation. Uh, he didn't think there was anything wrong with doing that. And he um, he also thought, like when he was talking to communist leaders, that it was a way of appealing to them on another level. And it was most con- consequential with Deng Xiaoping. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, so Nixon opened the door to China, but Carter walked through it and he normalized relations and creating the most important bilateral relationship in the world. At the time that Carter established full diplomatic relations, uh, China had an economy the size of a sub-Saharan African country. You know, I went there in that not long after that, and there were almost no cars. So it's, it's unimaginable how much this relationship changed China eventually. But what almost nobody knows is that on the last day of their summit in Washington. Uh, It's a little bit like the story I told about the pilot. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping says uh, to Carter, you know, you've been so such a great host and so generous. And Deng Xiaoping knew that, you know, he was going to be able to create earth shaking change for his country because he now had this relationship with the United States. Uh, And so he said, can I do anything for you? And Carter says, you know, yes, as a boy, I like to send uh, nickels to um, Christian missionaries in China. And um, I was wondering if perhaps you could consider allowing missionaries, Bibles and churches in China. And uh, they parted. And then the next morning, as Deng Xiaoping is preparing to leave, he said, uh, you know, uh, President Carter, I've been thinking about that overnight, and I, I cannot allow missionaries into our country. At the turn of the last century, they treated our people horribly, so no. Um, but um, Bibles, um, you know, if if Chinese people decide they want to be Christians, uh, sure, yes. I, I don't see any reason why they shouldn't be able to have churches. So now the churches are supervised by the state, but China has, you know, tens of millions 
of Christians, maybe I, I should know the number, might be well over 100 million mm -hmm. Christians, which would make Jimmy Carter the most effective missionary in world history. Mm -hmm. uh, and <laughs> you know, so there are little things like that 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 happen in the in the sort of uh, interstitial moments uh, that can really change history. And uh, I think we saw that on several uh, occasions in the in the Carter presidency. Well, you, you cover those very nicely, the, 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 the ripples that he started that, that come later. One of them big was is environmentalism. Uh, yeah. but, but let's talk about the Camp David Accords, because that was uh, really quite a um, he went against all of his advisors um, and and grounded out. Um, you know, I mean, just instead of a three day meeting, it took 13 days. And uh, you can't recount the whole story because you do a great job of recounting the story in the book. But but give people a little bit of an idea about about um, at least that was probably one of the most effective negotiations from the outside for the Middle East in the last 40, 50, 60 years. So. Well, uh, I, I wouldn't say one of, I would say easily the greatest diplomatic achievement mm -hmm. uh, of the last uh, you know, 50 years. And it's the most durable and important peace treaty since uh, the end of the Korean War. You could really say since the end of the Viet, uh, uh, since the end of World War II, since, mm. uh, you know, the uh, Korean uh uh, war didn't um, fully end. I mean, they still yes, it's actually not over yet, right? <laughs> haven't actually ended it yet. So, um, first of all, you know, for a president to get that intimately involved in negotiations, he was warned against it by everybody because he's putting everything on the line. He's really taking a lot of risks to do that, and no other president had done that before. I had thought that Theodore Roosevelt did when he settled the Russo-Japanese War in 1905, mm -hmm. but it turned out he did not actually go to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and he was kind of being an intermediary from afar. Carter, after the first couple of days, uh, Menachem Begin, the prime minister of Israel, and Anwar Sadat, the president of Egypt, were squabbling so much. They, they had just fought a, you know, a really horrible war five years earlier, and they had Egypt and Israel had fought four times in the previous 30 years. So there were these guys from either side in cabins at Camp David, very close to each other, who they had killed people in each other's families. So mm -hmm. they couldn't get along. They just started screaming at each other. Carter had to separate them. And, and for the rest of the uh, summit, he shuttled back and forth between them. And his attention to detail was much ridiculed. Um, and it was said wrongly that he, you know, took care of who got to use the White House tennis courts. Turns out that wasn't true. But mm -hmm. a lot of people thought he was lost in the weeds. This is a bogus charge. It was this attention to detail that got the Camp David Accords, the Alaska Lands Bill, you know, which added 105 million acres in Alaska, which we can talk about. Uh, even the deal with China, um, on and on, Panama Canal, all came out of Carter's attention to detail. But at the end of the conference, and each side had packed their bags to leave a few times. It had almost failed a few times. What finally really sealed it is was a human moment when, at the suggestion of his secretary, Susan Clough, Carter brought these photographs over to Begin, who was getting prepared to leave in failure. Uh, photographs, and he inscribed them personally to Begin's grandchildren. And Begin started crying mm -hmm. and uh, came back to the table. But what really amazed me, George, and which I actually honestly didn't know about, and lots of people I found out don't remember, is that after they left Camp David, that was just an accord. It wasn't an actual treaty. And mm -hmm. it fell apart. Begin backed away from it. People told him, you gave away too much on the Sinai. Mm -hmm. You know, forget it. And uh, so six months later, again, over the objections of all of his advisors, Carter went to the region. He put the whole deal back together with masking tape and chewing gum, you know, and, <laughs> and they got 
a deal which has stood the test of time. And there hasn't been a shot fired in anger uh, in the last uh, uh, 48 years between Israel and Egypt. And so, you know, I'm Jewish and a lot of American Jews, and a lot of Israelis, they don't like Jimmy Carter because he is very pro-Palestinian rhetorically. But what I say to them is um, Jimmy Carter was the greatest president for the security of the state of Israel of any president since Harry Truman, because the Egyptian army was the only army capable of driving Israel into the sea. They tried four times and they would have tried again if there hadn't been peace. Mm -hmm. So this was a huge deal, even though they didn't get the Palestinian state that Carter wanted and that uh, he uh, hoped to achieve in his second term. That was one of his big objectives if he, if he had been reelected. Well, uh, let's uh, do another success uh, story before we go to uh, <laughs> the opposite. The failures, yeah. um, The Pan- Panama Canal treaties. Uh, one of the things that you, you mentioned, which hadn't been clear to me at the time, uh, was that the government was concerned that, that uh, there's, there was so much potential terrorism against the Panama Canal and the Americans at the time um, that, that it would require 100,000 troops to protect it and so on. And so we were facing an issue that, that uh, was finessed by turning the Panama Canal over to the Panamanians and how hard it was uh, to get it through. So, and, and how much an influence that was on the whole South American attitude towards, uh, you know, big brother up north. One fun story that you told was how he got the Panama Canal Treaty approved with with Senator Hayakawa. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why don't you tell that story? I mean, we we, we, we know that you reminded me. this, but yeah, yeah. I'm so glad you reminded me of that uh, for yeah. for the Californians. Uh, so um, this was a super heavy lift in the Senate. Two thirds of the country was against it, in part because Ronald Reagan, who was already starting to run for president, was turning it into a big issue, getting everybody revved up. You know, we bought it, we paid for it, it's ours, we're not giving it back. Uh, And two thirds of the country's against it. It requires two thirds of the US Senate to get it approved. Mm. Fortunately, Carter got some Republican support. Some Democrats didn't support it, Um, Mm. but every single vote counted. And uh, they needed S.I. Hayakawa's vote. Now, he was this elderly senator from California who had had gotten elected because he had pulled the plug on a demonstration by black protesters at uh, San Francisco State University. And, um, and, you know, he demagogued his way into the Senate seat. Best known probably for falling asleep in the Senate and wearing a, a beret. So they hatch a scheme with Howard Baker, who's the Republican minority leader of the Senate, and Fritz Mondale, who's the vice president, and Carter had empowered him. He revolutionized the vice presidency by first empowering his vice president. So they call Hayakawa to Baker's office, and they put in a call from the president saying, where he says, Senator Hayakawa, I would so much like to have your wise counsel on foreign policy. If you could come over to the White House and see me, I I would really appreciate it. So Hayakawa, who has a big ego, goes over there and he tells them all his dopey anti-communist views. And uh, and Carter says, you know, I really would really appreciate your support on the Panama Canal. Hayakawa doesn't commit, but he leaves a book with him that he had written years earlier on semantics. He was a semantics professor. This had to be one of the most boring books ever written. And Jimmy (laughs) Carter is the only American president, except maybe Jefferson, who would actually read the book. So he reads the book overnight, calls Hayakawa the next day. Hayakawa quizzes him on it to see whether he's read it. And Carter passes the test and talks (laughs) about semantics with him. But Hayakawa has one more thing he wants. He says, uh, Mr. President, I'd like to come over and give you my wise counsel on foreign policy every two weeks. And this, I thought, was brilliant on Carter's yeah. part. <laughs> he says, oh, oh, uh, Senator Hayakawa, Sam, he was called Sam, uh, I can't possibly limit it to only uh, two weeks. So I wouldn't want to lock ourselves into that schedule. I'd like to 
have your wise counsel uh, uh, on as many occasions as I need it. And so Haikal goes, oh, that sounds good. And he votes yes, and it wins <laughs> by one vote. And of course, that's the last time S.I. Hayakawa <laughs> ever speaks to Jimmy Carter. <laughs> so so Carter learned. could be pretty savvy on occasion. Yeah, I was going to say, that was, that was a political move. He, he, he yes. was not naive when he yes, did that. that was very, very savvy. Yeah, and there were other moments like that. But then there were times like on tax reform when, you know, he doesn't even consult ahead of time with the heads of the tax writing committees, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Al, Al Ullman and Russell Long. And he just like, he thinks he's going to engineer the tax code. The problem with engineers too often, and, you know, they are, they, they get to the right solution. And then they think that everybody else will go, yeah, that's the rational right solution. Mm -hmm. We'll all come along, but that's not the way life works. And that's why engineers often fall short of being CEOs too. They, mm -hmm. they, they're missing a certain kind of, they have super high IQs. They're great problem solvers, but they're missing a little bit in terms of emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Hayakawa, Carter had that emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. but much of the time he, he didn't, and he could uh, hamper himself that way. Well, then let's talk about at least what I consider one of the failures, and that's Afghanistan. Um, uh, although it succeeded against the Soviet Union, it had severe long-term consequences. And I, I understand that Brzezinski, uh, uh, who is from Poland, uh, was really eager to do this. But the idea that you should create a new Vietnam to get the Soviet Union um, you know, tied up, uh, at the time in 79, I, I remember writing about it and saying, you're picking the wrong side. The Soviet Union is disintegrating. I, I, I'd been there. Uh, studied it, and, and uh, there were people. I mean, it's it's said that people didn't notice that, but there were several European writers that were noticing that the ethnic areas were going to split off from the Soviet Union within the next thirty years, or that they would never be able to hold it together. So it would seem to me that if you just look back and say between the two groups, you know who who does America have a more interest in, you know, or or a more long term, uh, you know, confluence of interests, Mujahideen, or uh, European Russians who are losing their communism. I, I think it's perfectly so, clear. Okay, okay yeah. so, so George, you were very farsighted in 1979 well, I, because yeah. the only person in the U.S. Senate, there was only one who thought, predicted that the Soviet Union would, would collapse and split up, and that was Pat Moynihan, and he did mm -hmm. it in the magazine that I started working for uh, a, a few years later in Newsweek. And other than that, nobody saw it coming. And Carter rightly was very critical of uh, the intelligence he was getting on all kinds of matters. Uh, you know, all over the world, there were intelligence failures, especially in Iran. But the intelligence community was not telling him that. We, what they were telling him is that the Soviet Union is getting aggressive again. So that's what he's hearing. And to a certain extent, any president is is you know the product of the information that they get and they were mm -hmm. worried i mean i agree with you like you know afghanistan is landlocked so it did not really give uh brzezinski was not telling the truth and he said this to me in our interview and i thought it was mm -hmm. kind of crazy he said that gave them access to the sea you know wh mm -hmm. which would strategically be very helpful for them it did not mm -hmm. uh and, but you know they had reason it, people forget that the the Arab countries really did have us over a barrel, so to speak. You know, our whole economy was dependent on Arab oil. And so if the Soviets, and in those days, it was the Soviets, you know, right. we were still in the middle of a Cold War. Uh, if they got control of the Persian Gulf, that would be a huge and legitimate problem. So I was kind of sympathetic to Carter, you know, reacting pretty strongly to this. Um, and um, But I think he made some mistakes in the way he reacted. So the grain embargo, for instance, was a really dumb idea mm -hmm. uh, because the, the Soviets just got grain from other countries. And mm -hmm. he alienated the farm belt to this day. I mean, I talked to the former Secretary of Agriculture in, in the uh, Clinton administration, Dan Glickman. He said when he was Secretary of Agriculture, people were still 
mad at the Democrats because of the grain embargo mm-hmm. 30 years later. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's maybe not a coincidence that rural America is so red now. And and the Olympic boycott was also kind of a dumb thing in retrospect. It was it, uh, uh, it, it penalized the athletes. It was very popular at first because the country really wanted a strong reaction. Uh, they didn't want the United States to just do nothing. You mm-hmm. know, this was the first time that uh, outside of Europe, that the Soviet empire had ever tried to expand its sphere of influence when they invaded Afghanistan. That was, that was a pretty big deal. I mean, mm-hmm. if, if you think that, you know, uh, that Hungary in 1956 or Czechoslovakia in 1968, those were still within Eastern Europe, their post-war mm-hmm. sphere of influence. Afghanistan really was not. So it was a pretty big deal. Uh, and he, but politically he was under enormous pressure from, from the right, uh, and um, it's true that uh, it, it, you know, supporting the Mujahideen turned out to be very costly. At that time, we didn't know anything about no, Muslim yes. extremism, and, and we we just, I mean, in Washington, they didn't know the difference between Sunni and Shiite. Walter Mondale yeah. was heard in the hall saying, "What's an Ayatollah?" I mean, where mm-hmm. this really cost us was in Iran, but it it was reflective of a broader uh, ignorance in the United States about uh, who we were allying with. Of course, it got a lot worse under Reagan. Um, we, we can't not talk about the hostages in Iran. Um, yeah. and, and of course, a really big story. And it, it didn't seem to be that big a story as it got started. Uh, that's the way you wrote it up. Um, and we don't have a lot of time left. But one of the things that you write about is uh, Joseph Reed, uh, one of the people on, oh, on uh, the, the Reagan team. Yeah, I'm really ne- glad you picked up on that. Yeah, yeah, negotiating to to slow down the release of the hostages or something, you know, close to what sounds like treason to 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 uh, just about anybody. So why don't you describe what's known and what's not known? Because people have talked about this, you know, yeah. back and forth. And, and, and no, you, I, I thought you did a great job of laying out what's known and what's not known and what's still not known about it. Right. So I, I didn't go all the way down the rabbit hole with yeah. October surprise theories, but, um, and, you know, some of them are almost certainly not true. Like George Bush, a few weeks before the election, when he's candidate for vice president, did not go to Paris. I, mm-hmm. William Casey, I think, did go to Madrid for this key meeting uh, that, but unfortunately, it, it, it seems like uh, the CIA later destroyed the other records that would confirm this meeting. But a cable did surface that I um, eventually was able to get access to Mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago, it surfaced a reporter, Bob Perry, dug it up, that indicated that the October surprise really might well have happened, which meant a deal between the Reagan campaign and the Ayatollah to not release the hostages before the election so Mm -hmm. as to deprive Carter of what would come his way. But what is definitely true is that the people on William Casey's team, like Joseph Werner Reed, who later became ambassador of Morocco, head of protocol, respectable banker, they were trying to do this. And Mm -hmm. and they they uh, and there's a letter that he wrote to his family where he said he was proud of his role in in preventing uh, Jimmy Carter from getting these hostages out while he was still president. Mm-hmm. And this, this really, I don't know if it's treason, but it, it is really pretty disturbing. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and so but there's a lot, obviously, to the Iran story. Uh, there, there is a lot that is not well known about it. Um, the Rockefeller people, Joseph Werner Reed was a Rockefeller representative. This is like, I, I don't like conspiracy theories generally, right, especially yeah. that will involve the Rockefellers, but this was one that was actually true. And just right. two years ago, all these records from the Chase Manhattan Bank were released and, and they had this thing called Project Eagle, which was an effort to basically, uh, before the October surprise, to get the Shah of Iran into the United States for medical treatment. They kind of pulled the wool over Carter's eyes. He agreed on a humanitarian basis to let the Shah in. And then the hostages were seized just 
a few days later. And, mm-hmm. and, and then his presidency unraveled in part because of that, in part because of Ted Kennedy's challenge, in large part because the economy got so bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Carter ended up appointing Volcker, who ended inflation. But before he ended inflation, he jacked mm-hmm. up interest rates over 15 percent, which really helped to doom uh, Jimmy Carter when he ran for re-election. George, do we have time to just talk a little bit about the environment, though? Uh, yes, absolutely. Let's, let's we're do done, that. Because we're, we're yeah. coming up on a, you know, the end of this. Um, no, we, 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 have, we have enough time. Let's talk about the okay. environmentalists. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just wanted to make sure to get this in. Um, Especially the, you, you talked about early on that he, he stopped the damming of a river when he was uh, a Georgia governor. The first time anybody ever stopped the Army Corps of Engineers. I thought that was a nice story, too. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he did a lot. He, he d- protected a lot uh, uh, in, when he was governor of Georgia, not just rivers, but uh, uh, all sorts of uh, nature preserves. And um, then he did the same as president. Uh, he helped um, protect the redwoods. Um, uh, mm-hmm. Lyndon Johnson had first uh, protected them, but then there was tremendous soil erosion from development on the perimeter that really threatened the redwoods and sequoias and and very important conservation work in California. Uh, in uh, Outside of LA, you know, the, the huge protected area uh, in, uh, they have a, uh, I, I should know the name of it, but uh, in, the, in the Santa Monica area, all of that protected land, Carter administration. Mm-hmm. Um, on the energy front, the first uh, fuel economy standards, the first toxic waste cleanup, uh, mm-hmm. dramatic strengthening of the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. I think people know that he put solar panels on the roof of the White House symbolically, mm-hmm. which Reagan took down, but that represented the first funding of green energy. And um, what really astonished me and in some ways depressed me is that um, on top, and I, I've just scratched the surface of what he did. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mentioned doubling of the size of the national park system with the acquisition of uh, 105 protection of 105 million uh, acres in Alaska. Um, but uh, which despite whatever happens in the Ar- Arctic Wildlife Refuge, that's a very small portion of that protected land. And I think that'll come yeah. up right. Now. In any event, shortly before he leaves office, he gets this report on what was then often called carbon pollution or global warming, which he had been reading about. I found he'd underlined articles in the journal Nature when he was governor of Georgia. Other Mm -hmm. presidents played golf. He read scientific journals Mm -hmm. and he signed off on a new policy for the United States right before he left office uh, of reducing CO2 emissions to no more than two degrees uh, centigrade above pre-industrial levels, which was precisely what the Paris Climate Agreement came to in 2015. And this was 19. 80. So this mm-hmm. adds a tragic dimension to Reagan's victory, because mm-hmm. in a second Carter administration, no, we wouldn't have gotten off fossil fuel right away, but he planned for hybrid cars by the mid-1980s, and he was uh, very conscious that we needed to take global warming seriously, and we would have begun to do so in 1981. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's um, it, as you said, it's, it's a little depressing to find out because you, you'd think once something gets started that it has to keep going, but it doesn't always work that way. Um, in fact, one of the things that you can kind of take away from the Carter presidency that you can you can get more done by smiling and laughing and and not really being very substantive than you can if you're kind of too righteous about what you're trying to accomplish. Well, um, I want to just correct that. I- I wouldn't say you can get more done because mm-hmm. Carter got a lot more done yeah. for the long-term good of the country than those other be more presidents. popular. <laughs> you can be more popular. So yeah. the, the problem, you know, journalists, and I'm a journalist, we tend to judge presidents in real time by 
partly by how popular they are. Historians have a little bit of a different task. Mm -hmm. Our job is to look at how did they change the country? How did they improve people's lives? How did they change the world? So after he left the presidency, uh, he was kind of depressed uh, and he hadn't come up with the idea of the Carter Center yet. And he was uh, walking down the path at Emory and a visiting professor from Harvard named Carl Deutsch, professor of international relations, stopped him and said, you know, President Carter, a thousand years from now, very few presidents will be remembered. You will be one of them because of your human rights policy. It was a hypocritical policy in certain ways. You know, they support, he supported the Shah for a long time, Marcos, mm. but he was the first president, the first leader who ever set a standard for how go other governments should treat their own people. And that, you know, first of all, we have more than twice as many democracies now mm -hmm. around the world than we did in those days. And a lot of the people in those countries will tell you that Jimmy Carter kicked that off. So when, you know, when a president leaves office, you, you don't know yet. I mean, we didn't know how long Camp David would last. We didn't know mm -hmm. Whether, you know, we didn't know that even like George W. Bush would be influenced by, you know, Carter's human rights policy. We didn't know how a lot of things would work out. To your point about Afghanistan, that didn't work out very well. So that right. would be on the debit side, you know. But we need to look at these presidents in context. And we also need to understand that character is destiny and that mm -hmm. is decency and honesty and accountability uh, should uh, help light our way forward, that we can have presidents of the United States who uh, uh, not only respect the Constitution, keep us out of war, who's the first president since Thomas Jefferson, uh, under whom there were no shots uh, fired in combat, uh, and, and also inspire us that we can we can do better than what, what how we've done in the last four years yeah let's let's finish with one thing because uh, carter is of course known for his post-presidency uh, work for habitats for humanity which i found interesting to find out it, it arose out of that uh, radical farm that was right near him in, yeah. in georgia i didn't yeah. realize that it was a local thing that he had gotten involved with um but uh, we don't have a lot of time to talk about it. Your, your book covers it very nicely for those of you who, who want to get a, a, an overview of it. But he, he, he caused problems in some of his diplomacy, too, because of how he did it. So what's your overall scorecard? I think it's, a, it's the basic, basic idea with, that you've just described out as presidency. So many things went right. So many things were long-term positive. Um, so many substantive things were accomplished. Um, but now the post-presidency. What 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 does what batting average be as a post president? Because he irritated all the other presidents. Uh, yeah, you know, that's one of the things he yeah, was good at. He did. Yeah. <laughs> so my overall take is that he, you know, as I've indicated, he's underrated president, slightly mm. overrated former president. And I say mm. that because I don't like the easy shorthand that you you know hear any all over the place. You know, bad president, great ex president. Right. Uh, when you're not president anymore, and we're going to find this out soon. You don't have any power, you know, <laughs> and you really can't do much. You have, um, so Carter has done a lot given that he has no power and it's been very inspiring much of it. He didn't actually uh, ever run Habitat for Humanity. He spends a, a week, a year building houses. And I, I built one with him in Memphis in 2016, uh -huh. which was really fun. He showed me how to hammer. Um, but he has, you know, they have essentially eradicated Guinea worm disease or come very close, a debilitating disease that afflicted millions of people, and mostly in Africa. It was a great and story, now, yeah. And now uh, only like 30 cases around the world right now. Um, and, and they have done important work in supervising monitoring elections. Uh, and uh, he talked Daniel Ortega out of leaving power in Nicaragua. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, very impressive. I wish he had been able to. Well, he wouldn't have been able to talk Trump out of it, but he convinced <laughs> Ortega. Ortega said it was rigged, and you know, Carter convinced him. Look, losing's hard, but this is what the people of your country want. So there were some real highs like that, and then 
in, in 1994, he prevented wars in Haiti and North Korea. But what he did afterward in both cases indicates some of the problems he had. He went on CNN before reporting to President Clinton, which you right. can understand that would annoy Bill Clinton. And yeah. they had a very fraught relationship. Uh, and then he would publicly criticize uh, Obama while pretty recently in 2017, 2018, not saying anything about Trump. Now, why? Mm -hmm. Now, since then, he has been very tough on Trump. Why was he not tough in my conversations with him and in his public statements earlier on? Because even though he was in his mid 90s, he wanted to go to North Korea and make peace there. And uh, he still wanted to be part of the action, <laughs> right? So once Trump decided to do that himself, mm -hmm. then Carter didn't have to, you know, uh, make nice to Trump anymore. So he's a very tough, intense, sometimes sometimes difficult guy who uh, has been a handful for his successors. He got along very well with Gerald Ford, his predecessor, and they got mm -hmm. some things accomplished. Yeah, you, you talked about their yeah, partnership. I thought that was but, uh, was fascinating. Yeah, but um, but he uh, he well, he's, we, he's we definitely of, hurt. Yeah, he's definitely. Yeah, we've run out of time, but there's only one thing. Uh, you, you mentioned Hunter Thompson. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. This wild uh, reporter uh, having stated that that uh, Jimmy Carter, really early on when he was governor, is one of the three meanest men he's ever met. Yeah. I, that's a, a, I don't want to stop end with that one. What say something nice. Yeah. I just thought yeah, that well, was fascinating. I just remembered it. He um, meant it as a compliment. He said the other yeah, two. He meant it as a compliment, right. <laughs> uh, the head of the Hells Angels and um, wow. Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali, right, who Jimmy Carter was very, very friendly with, and he sent him to try to get the hostages out, which is a, another story. But uh, Hunter Thompson meant it as a compliment. He loved Jimmy Carter. He, I, I argue he helped make Jimmy Carter president. Mm -hmm. I don't think that uh, Carter would have been president without Hunter Thompson's very strong support because he convinced a lot of young journalists uh, that Carter, obscure former governor of Georgia, was somebody that he should uh, look at. Look at uh, Carter was giving a speech. Hunter Thompson, when Ted Kennedy and others had been speaking before, was bored. Would go out to his car to get, refresh his iced tea with wild turkey, and then he hears Carter talking about racial injustice, quoting Bob Dylan, who he had become friendly with in the same yeah. way. And I think people know he became very friendly with a number of musicians, and. Hunter goes out and gets his tape recorder and he makes a tape of this speech from 1974 and he plays it all over the country for young journalists and really helps put Carter on the map. And he stayed supportive of Carter to the end of his life. So he saw things and wrote things in Rolling Stone that other people didn't see in Carter uh, because there were a lot of uh, progressives who didn't like Carter. They didn't. Right like his positions on certain issues. And he was kind of conservative on certain budget issues and other things. Um, so it was always a, a um, people didn't feel like they could, they had his number. And there was a certain amount of any Southern bias, which Hunter Thompson, among others, saw through and understood that they were dealing with a compelling and historic individual. Well, then let's finish with this one very funny story about Jimmy Carter uh, speaking after he's become president. And then he mentions the accent and saying, well, now we don't have to listen to somebody that speaks with an accent anymore from Washington. <laughs> right. Well, this is when he would talk to Southern audiences. Yes. Uh, he would <laughs> it's say, a great yeah, joke. <laughs> then, wouldn't it be nice to have a president who doesn't doesn't have an accent doesn't have an accent yeah we haven't <laughs> talked about his you know his su super colorful family uh and yeah. i just leave you with uh when he was an obscure candidate in 1975 his brother billy you know people remember billy beer actually billy liked to pour out the contents in the toilet and fill the beer can with with vodka yeah. um but um he you know he said uh he said, uh, I got a mother uh, who entered the Peace Corps at age 68. I got uh, one sister who's a holy roller. That's Jimmy's sister, Ruth, who was an evangelist. And another sister who rides with the Hells Angels. That was Sister Gloria, whose tombstone reads, she rides 
in Harley Heaven now. And I got a brother who thinks he's going to be president of the United States. I'm the only normal one in this family. Uh, <laughs> and, and so it's a, it's a pretty uh, colorful story, uh, even, if, yeah. uh, even if there's no real sex in it except in his heart. <laughs> That's a great way to end it. All right. Well, thank you very, very much, Jonathan, uh, for Thanks, George. Uh, uh, and, and a great book, a uh, great uh, look at a president that at least people our age still remember uh, distinctly as a nice break from Nixon, but uh, not exactly what people expected um, he would be like. Um, so thank you very much. And so ends another event at the Commonwealth Club in its 119th year of enlightened discussion. Thank you very much for joining us. <laughs>